My name is Kathy Saunders, and I am the Curator of Education here at Lippitt House Museum. And I'm joined uh, by my colleagues, Carrie Taylor of Lippitt House Museum and Kathy Garrett Cox of Maymont, who will be our speakers tonight. We will put their bios uh, into the chat in a few moments. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to share a little context for why we are gathered here. This kind of collaboration uh, really was inspired out of the deepest, darkest times of the pandemic when many house museums began to up their online presence. And so we realized that there was this opportunity to use Zoom uh, to collaborate across distance. Some of you actually may have joined us last year for our collaboration with Victoria Mansion. So taking advantage of the Rhode Island and Virginia connections of both of tonight's presenters, uh, we reached out to Maymont because we saw interesting comparisons in the histories that we interpret. Charles Lippitt and James Dooley were contemporaries. Uh, one was a son of an immigrant, while the other traced his ancestry back to the earliest colonial days of the country. As youths, they lived in states that were on opposing sides of the war. Now, you'd think they'd have nothing in common. However, when we ex uh, when examined, you'll see that their wealth and the social positions that came with that uh, make their lives similar despite living 600 miles apart. Both men traced their origins of their wealth to manufacturing. Then in the boom and bust times of the second industrial revolution following the civil war, their fortunes grew through investments and other business opportunities. Tonight, our presenters will address the essential question, given the advantages that their privileged births give them, how did they choose to make their mark on their local communities and what legacies did they leave behind? We will begin with two presentations uh, and then we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions. You can put your questions in the Q&A uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom bar and we'll try to take as many as we can at the end uh, and we do plan to wrap up about 7.30. If you want to enable closed captions, you may do so by clicking the CC button on your Zoom bar at the bottom. The session is also being recorded and we will notify everyone when, uh, who's been registered when that is posted. But now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Garrett Cox. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and thank you for inviting me today to be a part of this presentation. When looking at this period in US history, it has been interesting to compare these two cities and these two men. Unlike Providence, Richmond after the Civil War was a city in ruin. Forward-thinking Southerners, such as James Henry Dooley, were able to seize the opportunities of this landscape and propel themselves forward while working to ensure the future of Richmond and the South. I'll start by giving you some background information on James Dooley, and then we'll look at Richmond after the Civil War and Dooley's influence on Richmond and how his legacy continues today. James Henry Dooley, let me just advance my slides. Sorry about that. James Henry Dooley was born in Richmond on January 17, 1841. He was born to a large family, the third of nine children, who were second generation Irish immigrants. He grew up middle class with many advantages from his father's prosperous business dealings. His parents, John and Sarah Dooley, had immigrated from, immigrated from Limerick, Ireland in 1834. They settled first in Alexandria, but quickly moved to Richmond, settling here in 1836. John soon established himself as a hatter and quickly grew his business to a shop and manufactory, the Great Southern Hat and Cap Manufactory, which was quite successful. He also had business interests outside of Richmond, including investments in railroads and real estate as far away as Chicago. John Dooley became a prominent business leader in Richmond and was politically active, though he did not serve in the legislature. James Dooley was educated in Richmond and early on had big dreams, as he wrote in his Latin dictionary, when I have $5,178,360, I will stop making money. James will eventually surpass his childhood goal. Before the Civil War, James studied at Georgetown College, now University. 
University. After completing his undergraduate degree, he left to fight in the Civil War. His father, who as the founder and commanding officer of the Montgomery Guard, a volunteer militia made up primarily of Irish immigrants in Richmond, had already joined his militia with the 1st Virginia Infantry Re Regiment. James's brother, John, also served and was captured at Gettysburg and held prisoner for 18 months at Johnson's Island on Lake Erie. James, however, did not serve long as he was injured at the Battle of Williamsburg on May 5, 1862. He served the rest of the war in the Ordnance Department in Richmond. This placement allowed him to be back in Richmond and to take over much of the running of his father's business dealings. This early opportunity helped give James some of his future business acumen. After the war, James Julie went back to Georgetown to complete a master's degree. He was always proud of his academic achievements and spoke of it later in life. He was first in his class all four years. After the war, for Southerners, Reconstruction was a period of radical change and transition to a new social and economic order. In Richmond, a massive amount of people had moved into the city during the war. In 1860, Richmond had a population of 38,000. By 1865, at the end of the war, 130,000 people now called Richmond their home. This put a large strain on the city as it began to rebuild after the war. Although it should be noted that this large influx into the city didn't last long, as by 1870, the city had reduced to a more reasonable growth with 51,000 people as residents. The city would continue a slow and steady growth throughout the last few decades of the 19th century. James began his immediate post-war years when Virginia was under US military control and occupation according to the terms of the Reconstruction Act. The city's manufacturing and tobacco and flour were at a standstill. The South needed to confront their challenges and move from an agricultural slave-based slave economy in order to catch up with the rest of the country. Because the rest of the country was experiencing unprecedented growth and entrepreneurs and industrialists were building vast fortunes. As with so much of the city, John Dooley's hat factory was one of the properties that burned during the evacuation fire of the city. He did not rebuild the store or factory and passed away in 1868, leaving James as the oldest surviving son in charge of his mother and sister's affairs. James, however, came into this new uncertain time equipped to meet these new challenges. He had read law prior to pursuing his master's degree at Georgetown. His mentor, William Green, was a well-respected lawyer in Richmond and was a specialist in municipal law, which included corporations, property, and contracts. This early education would serve James well for his future business dealings. By the end of Reconstruction in 1870, when Virginia was readmitted to the Union, there was little physical trace of Richmond's wartime devastation. Production at Tredegar Ironworks began to flourish again, tobacco manufacturing soared above pre-war capacity and the flour mills reopened that had been destroyed by the fire. James was forward thinking and was ready to take on these new challenges and seek out his fortune. He saw potential in Richmond and wanted the city to be a player on an international landscape. He would work first in politics and eventually in business to push Richmond onto the national stage. James spent some of his early years serving in the Virginia legislature. As a member of the Conservative Party, he came to office in 1871 when the Democratic Conservatives gained control of both branches of state government. This was the first of three terms that he served in the legislature. Serving in the first legislature after Virginia was readmitted to the Union in 1870, he served alongside Virginia's first African-American legislatures seen here on the bottom row of this 1871 photo of Virginia legislators from the Library of Virginia. James, however, was on the side of the funders who worked to pass the poll tax legislation. Through a complicated process, the funders wanted to pay down the Commonwealth's massive pre-war debt. They felt this obligation took precedent over all other obligations. The conservatives continued to pass laws in the 1870s that effectively shut down many poor and working class men, both white and black from the polls. Virginia continued to pass laws to disenfranchise 
disenfranchise the black community. Although 1871 saw 13 African-American men serve in the Virginia legislature, by 1877, only eight African-American men had been elected. Much of this decline can be traced to the new poll tax legislation, which also reduced African-American voters. In 1877, James decided to leave office after serving for nearly a decade. By this time, Virginia is entangled in a budget crisis and duly decided to step away from politics to, quote, tend to the condition and pressure of my business. James had continued his law practice while serving in the legislature. His time in the House of Delegates gave him a global view on Richmond and the South and how he could help propel both forward in business. At only 36 years old, he had finished his three terms in office and was now turning his attention to business and in particular, the railroads. As Dr. Ayers says in Promise of the New South, quote, railroads were the key to economic growth in the last half of the 19th century. The South built railroads faster than the nation as a whole. Dooley was involved in many railroad enterprises, but his three largest deals were with the Richmond and Danville, the Chesapeake and Ohio, and the Seaboard Airline. The Richmond and Danville Railroad set about linking small and scattered rail lines into this, in the South with other lines, including the Georgia and Pacific. He was a founding member of the Seaboard Airline, which he hoped could strengthen Richmond and make her a player on the international level. The Seaboard Airline was built to connect many lines throughout the South from Richmond to Tampa, and then head west to terminate at the new Nicaraguan Canal that was being planned. In this image, the president of the Seaboard Airlines, John Skeleton Williams son, drives the final spike in the line in Richmond. During the celebration speech for 400 guests at the Jefferson Hotel here in Richmond in June of 1900, James proudly declared, growing and expanding with unparalleled rapidity, we demand new channels of trade and access to all markets upon equal terms with the greatest world powers. James's business ventures were not only in railroads, but included finance and real estate as well. As he said to the Chamber of Commerce in 1890, I was always bull on Richmond. The first money I ever made, I invested in Richmond dirt. In addition to investing in Richmond, he also had investments out west, and in particular in Chicago, as his father had. He was elected to two New York social clubs, the University and the Manhattan Club, that gave him entree to new business associates. It is no wonder that the New York Star newspaper opened an article on James with the phrase that he was among the most prominent Southern men on Wall Street. He solidified his status by 1892 when he was listed as one of the country's millionaires in the, in the New York Tribune Monthly. In this listing, his occupations were noted as law and building and management of railroads. By 1902, he is still on the list, but is now listed with just one abbreviation, C-A-P-T for capitalist. While James rose to success in the political and financial world, he had a partner who was also helping his rising star in the social sphere that was just as necessary at this time. James had met and married Sally May in September 1869. Sally was from a prosperous plantation family in Southwest Virginia. Her father was a doctor and her mother died when she was young. She could trace her family back to early settlements in, in Virginia and royalty in England. Sally was active in genealogical organizations such as the Colonial Dames and the Daughters of the American Revolution and preservation groups such as the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities. But as with Margaret Lippitt, she was staunchly anti-suffrage and a member of the Virginia Association opposed to women's suffrage. Sally brought the social connections and old world cachet to James' energy and drive. As James' fortune rose, it was time to create a home befitting his new standing in society. Maymont was imagined during a horseback ride when James and Sally came riding up the hill and saw the views of the James River. They purchased the property, which had previously been a dairy farm, in 1886 and began transforming it into the beautiful estate we have today. They hired local architect Edgerton Rogers, 
who, like so many popular architects of this time, had studied abroad in Italy and moved back to the States with an old world understanding of how to project their new wealth with stately details in their home. The mansion was completed in 1893 and became a show place for the Dooleys. This home was not a country estate, but instead a suburban estate, one that included a large mansion, formal gardens, and an arboretum, but all close enough for Mr. Dooley to ride to work each day in his fashionable carriage. The Dooleys entertained lavishly, and rooms such as the library showcased to their guests that they were cultured and learned as they looked at their art collection from around the world. As with many gilded, gen gilded age gentlemen, James was an avid art lover and collector. He was an active member of the Richmond Art Club, which hosted exhibitions and talks, and served as the club's president for 10 years. His passion for art is showcased throughout Maymont with many one-of-a-kind pieces that the Dooleys acquired. Mrs. Dooley used Maymont for lavish entertaining, such as here in the blue drawing room, which helped promote James in the upper levels of Richmond society. Included in their many parties was the luncheon at Maymont in 1902 for all of the governors and their wives. Over 250 guests were entertained at this luncheon. The dining room showcased walls covered in painted canvas in an alcove, an Italian sculpture aptly titled The Birth of Wine, and at the other end of the room, an impressive cabinet from the Paris Exposition of 1855 filled with a copy of President Hayes's Presidential China. As the Dooleys continued their rise in Richmond, they decided they needed a second home to escape the heat and humidity in the summer. Prior to building this home, they traveled abroad in the summer and sometimes up to the mountains in New Hampshire. They chose Afton Mountain in the Blue Ridge here in Virginia as their summer home location. It is near where Mrs. Dooley's family lived in Stanton, Virginia. They named their summer home Swananoa and completed it in 1912. As with the Lippitt summer home in Newport, this home is built on an even grander scale at twice the size of Maymont. Similar to the summer homes up north, this home was designed in the Italianate style with a Georgian marble facade. Upon Mrs. Julie's death, this home was bequeathed to Mr. Julie's sisters with many pieces of furnishings coming to Maymont. The sisters sold the home and the remaining furnishings. It went through several hands before eventually being purchased by the current owner's family and is still held privately. It is open a few times a year in the summer and for special events. James Dooley died in 1922 and Sally May followed in 1925. As was popular at the time, the Dooleys turned their fortune into great philanthropy for the city of Richmond. The Dooleys never had children, and so decided to divide their fortune among their many charitable organizations. They left bequests to the Richmond Public Library, the Medical College of Virginia, their churches, and their largest monetary bequest was $3 million to St. Joseph's Orphanage, which is now St. Joseph's Villa, and is still in operation. One of the best legacies they left to the city is Maymont. A crowning jewel for Richmonders, the Dooleys left the estate to be a public park and the house to be a museum. As of 1975, the nonprofit Maymont Foundation has overseen the daily operations of the estate. Maymont today is an urban oasis in the city of Richmond. While living at Maymont, the Dooleys added Italian and Japanese gardens, specimen trees, and shrubs from around the world, creating an arboretum for us to enjoy today. Over the years, Maymont has added new attractions for the guests to enjoy, including the Robbins Nature Center and wildlife habitats. All of this attracts over 700,000 guests a year to Maymont. James should be remembered for his devotion to Richmond as a leader in the South. His success in promoting transportation, finance, and commerce all led to a more prosperous Richmond. His legacy is cemented in the way that so many Gilded Age entrepreneurs endure through his charitable gifts. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to Carrie. While Carrie is setting up, uh, I am going to share a little quiz here that we have uh, for you all. So um, uh, if you're familiar with the poll function uh, in 
Zoom. I'm going to administer this poll. And we have this question about comparison of populations of U, uh, US cities in 1880. So uh, on this list, there are four cities. Three of them were in the top 25 most populated cities, but one uh, was not so populous and did not fall on that list. So we just thought we'd throw out a little uh, quiz, see what uh, how your geography of 1880 lines up. Is that coming in? And I'm I'm watching the results coming in right now. Uh, most guesses are going towards Louisville, but we still have some folks coming in, but pretty spread across the other three. Um, so I'm just curious. And it looks like Carrie's getting her slides set up. So that's good because by the time that poll is done and we give the results, uh, we uh, Carrie will be ready to go. All right. Let's see, okay, a couple more people still voting and then we're gonna close this poll. All right, let's see, everybody ready? Carrie, can you give me a drum roll? <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm all situated now. Great. All right, okay, we're gonna end the poll. Uh, we'll share the results here. Uh, so the votes were, um, most people thought it was Louisville, uh, and I will share that, in fact, the least populated city was Atlanta. Uh, Louisville ranked 16th with about 123,000 people. Providence was 20th with about 104,000. Richmond was 25th with 63,000, and Atlanta at that time only was the 49th most popular state. So you can see how things have changed. With that, I will turn it over to Carrie. Great. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Close the poll here. Oh. Great. Uh, it was great to hear um, Kathy talk about Maymont. And now I'm going to talk with a contemporary of Mr. Dooley here, uh, Charles Warren Lippitt. <clears throat> the Lippets are one of an old Rhode Island family whose prominence grew along with their wealth. Um, during the first wave of the American Industrial Revolution, two Lippet brothers built Rhode Island's third cotton mill in 1809. Like many New Englanders, they participate in an industry that benefits from enslaved labor. Henry, the third generation in the textile business marries Mary Ann Balch in 1845. Their family grows as does the Lippitt Manufacturing Company, expanding to woolen production during the Civil War. A transportation, manufacturing, and banking center, Providence prospers providing cannon, rifles, swords, blankets, uniforms, and even steam engines for Union warships. Despite disruptions in the supply of cotton during the war, it was a financially profitable time for the Lippets. The value of their financial holdings increases 155% from 1861 to 1865 as they capitalize on a stock market boom. During the war years, the eldest of their six children, Charles Warren, attends nearby Brown University. He rows crew, swims, and is described as a energetic student. Charlie, as he's called, is the scholar of his family. After graduating from Brown in 1865 at age 18, he travels west to the Colorado Territory for a bit of adventure. Taking advantage of his family's privilege, the five foot nine inch blue eyed Charlie then sails to Europe with passport in hand touring for several years, including a time at Cambridge studying with tutors. Four years after graduation, despite a desire to study law, Charles joins the family business, now H. Lippitt and Company, a corporation which manages three mills. Two years later, he's appointed treasurer and agent of the Silver Spring Bleaching and Dyeing Company and manages the works. The mill produces various styles of colored cotton and bleach goods, employing 300 operatives. 
During reconstruction, many New England mills moved south to be closer to raw materials and a cheaper labor supply. One example of increasing labor costs is the long campaign for a 10 hour workday. In Rhode Island, it starts in 1872 with several strikes. Needless to say, Charles is not a fan. In 1883, opposition to proposed legislation, he writes, quote, those who will suffer most from this law will be those who work by the peace. And it is an established fact that these operatives try every way in their power to increase the hours in which they can run their machines. I do not think there is a person in the mills who does, does any more or arduous work or occupy more time than I am obliged to give in looking after my business. The passage of such a law would be of the greatest detriment to the state. The work week for operatives in Lippitt Mills is 66 hours. Depending on the job, they make a dollar or a dollar fifty a week. Despite what Charles says, the work was physically dangerous. If you don't work, you lose your job and possibly your company owned housing. Despite labor issues, the business thrives and Charles oversees the mill for the next 32 years, ultimately serving as president with 600 employees when it sold in 1903. During his career, he's made co-partner of H. Lippitt and Company, and he serves on the board of another Lippitt Mill, an insurance company, and a bank. Charles does what's expected of him, but he has ambitions beyond the textile industry. Since he's single, Charlie lives at home with his parents and five brothers and sisters in the house Henry and Marianne build on Hope Street in 1863, present-day Lippitt House Museum. As a young man, he develops an interest in civic affairs. He joins the Republican Party, which dominates Rhode Island politics from the 1860s until 1935. At age 24, he's already a party insider, noting in his diary preparations to attend an 1871 candidate nominating meeting for city council. This is where the candidates are crowned. In anticipation of his political debut, Charlie writes an entry in to pump himself up in his diary. This is my first primary meeting for this purpose, and I shall endeavor to uh, learn and not force myself forward. Whatever happens, do not let go of yourself tonight. Be cautious. In no circumstance, be put down if you can prevent it. Think as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. Republican Party officials concentrate power through several measures, including requiring naturalized citizens to own real estate to be eligible to vote in city council elections. And a side note here, in 1870, 41% of, of Providence County residents are foreign born. This requirement disenfranchises the growing number of immigrants in Rhode Island's urban centers. The next year in 1872, an entry indicates Charlie's interest in national politics. He writes in his diary, quote, mother and father have each abused me for my wasting my money on this paper. And he's talking about the daily Congressional Globe, which prints uh, congressional debates and presidential messages. Both have ridiculed my action on the ground that everything that was worth knowing would be published in the Providence Papers. All father and mother seem to need is the barest abstract. They are interested alone in the result and care nothing for the facts. To pursue his interest in politics, Charles joins the Franklin Lyceum, an influential organization composed of young lawyers and politicians. Charles is elected Lyceum president in 1875 and 1876. Here he becomes good friends with Nelson Aldrich, Republican Party leader. Aldrich starts as a city councilman, but in 1881 is elected to the U.S. Senate and serves for the next 30 years. He becomes the majority leader and is known as, quote, the general manager of the United States. Aldrich is succeeded in his seat by Charlie's younger brother, Harry. Charles's wealth provides him entree into a club where he builds ties with the rising generation of Rhode Island's political elite. It's during this time that Charles's father, Henry, is elected governor for two terms. He names Charles his chief of staff. He accompanies his father to public ceremonies, including traveling to national 
1876 Centennial Commemoration Events. This position gives 28-year-old 28 28 Charlie a behind-the-scenes view to politicking at the state level. For many businessmen like Henry Lippitt, politics is a way to protect your business interests while preserving the social order that keeps you and your family at the top. Starting in 1875, Charles serves in leadership positions on the influential Providence Board of Trade, which his father helped found in 1868. Charles takes it a step further, serving as the vice president of the National Board of Trade in 1880. Because of Rhode Island's small size, what happens in Providence affects the entire state. The Providence Board of Trade is a powerful organization led by influential industrialists. In addition to several textile mills, Providence is home to, quote, the five industrial wonders of the world. Corliss steam engine, Nicholson file, American screw, Gorham silver, and brown and sharp. Some said the Providence Board of Trade was more influential than the mayor. The board lobbies for pro-business infrastructure projects during what becomes known as the Second Industrial Revolution. In his 1883 presidential address to the board, Charles makes a statement that Jeff Bezos would probably agree with, quote, the foundation of commerce is quick communication when touting the importance of infrastructure for river transportation, something Rhode Islanders today are reminded of with the emergency closure of the Interstate 195 bridge. In the 1890s, there were more than 1,500 factories in the Providence area and they needed workers. Infrastructure was needed for Providence's growing population. During the Civil War in 1864, the population of Providence was 54,000. By 1890, the population balloons to 132,000, an increase of 144% in 26 years. 74% of the state's population lives in Providence County. Today, it's just 58%. However, in 1890, there's a requirement that a man uh, must own property valued at $134 to be eligible to vote in city council elections, a de facto poll tax, which disenfranchises many of the low-income residents who work in those 1,500 factories. From, 18, from the 1870s to the 1890s, some of the capital investments that transform Providence into a modern city include wide tree-lined boulevards, a water supply and sewage system, large public schools, a multi-level central train station, a 400-acre urban park, and deepening the Port of Providence. These projects championed by Charles Lippitt and the Providence Board of Trade improve the business environment, but also make life better for residents. Many of these projects still benefit Providence today. In 1886, Charlie marries Margaret Farnham when he's 39 and she 25. They first live in a small house on Chesterfield Street, but soon Charlie buys a large Italianate style three-story brick and brownstone on Young Orchard Avenue. It's three blocks down Hope Street from his parents and across the street from his friend, Senator Aldrich. Today, only an outbuilding remains, which Charlie uses as a gymnasium and office. Together, they have six children. Sadly, only three sons survived to adulthood, Charlie, Al Alexander, and Gorton. In 1892, they start construction on a summer house in Newport, the summer getaway for New York's elite, which he names Breakwater. The site is located on a rocky point along the popular Cliff Walk, a site that he's desired since he was a teenager. He hires New York-based Robert H. Robinson as the architect and Olmsted Associates, the landscaper. The castle-like mansion, complete with crenellated parapets and towers, was one of the biggest in Newport. The house was finally completed in 1899 after years of local speculation that a building that big must be for public use and not just for the Lippitz family of five. The mansion was designed to make a statement. The summer, quote, cottage had a triangular plan with the principal entrance from the interior courtyard, the service wing on the east side, and the quote, breakwater room in the South Tower facing the ocean. Family tradition holds there was a swimming pool in the basement fed by seawater. 
It made a big impact on the social scene written up in the New York Times on several occasions. One writer referred to it as, quote, a red brick palace, and another called it an Elizabethan castle. There's a tradition that Edith Wharton, whose family's home, Land's End, was up the road, didn't care for what locals commonly called Lippitt's Castle. What message is Charles trying to convey with this house? Is there more to it than just a display of wealth? Is it an opportunity to make a statement to New York's social, political, and business elite beyond Little Rhodey? Neither his father nor mother lived to see it, but Charles is elected governor in 1895 and again in 1896. His political positions are similar to his father's, pro-business and social order. A spoke in the powerful Rhode Island Republican machine, he's a strong advocate for high tariffs that protect Rhode Island manufacturing. During his governorship, plans were approved for a new state house designed by New York architectural firm McKim Mead and White. Charles speaks at the 1896 Cornerstone Ceremony. The completion of this new Capitol building is the end of a dual colonial era state houses in Providence and Newport, physically completing the transition away from Rhode Island's maritime and rural roots to urban Providence as the political and economic center of Rhode Island. While governor, Charles is nominated for vice president on the 1896 Republican presidential ticket with William McKinley, but only receives eight votes. McKinley has protective tariffs as a major plank in his campaign platform. Charles later goes on the road as the McKinley proxy in his race against William Jennings Bryan and gives speeches in New York, Cleveland, among other places. While governor, Margaret entertains extensively at their Providence home to help care for their three young sons and their two big homes, the Lippets employ eight female live-in servants, a waitress, chambermaid, two laundresses, a nurse for each of the three boys, a cook, and likely a coachman. Many are immigrants from Nova Scotia. Because the Lippets pay staff to take care of domestic chores, Margaret can pursue activities outside their home. Like Sally Mae Dooley, Margaret is active in several hereditary organizations, including the Daughters of the American Revolution, and later is a leader in World War I relief organizations. Margaret is also politically active, most notably the women's anti-suffrage movement. The belief that voting was an unnecessary burden for women was held by many upper class women like Margaret, who benefited from the status quo power structure. In 1907, Margaret testifies at the General Assembly against a suffrage bill saying, quote, women do not want the ballot, are not qualified for it, and have not the time to study the subject to vote intelligently. She helps found the Rhode Island Association opposed to women's suffrage and participates in debates, organizes meetings, gives public talks, and writes letters to the Providence Journal. I assume this is done with Charles's consent since it aligns with his conservative uh, politics. With Charles exiting the governor's office in 1897, the completion of the Newport Mansion in 1899, and the sale of the Silver Spring Mill in 1903, Charles transitions into a new role, amateur historian. Even though he still goes to work every day until 1922, He's active in several hereditary organizations, including election to president of the National Society of the Cincinnati. Both he and Margaret are members of the Rhode Island and Newport Historical Societies, volunteering in events and lending objects for displays. It appears much of Charles's time is devoted to researching, writing, and speaking about American history, especially Rhode Island history. He publishes works about Rhode Island's War of 1812 hero Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, uh, American Constitutional Law, the 1778 Battle of Rhode Island, and the May 1776 Rhode Island Declaration of Independence. What's the cost for this turn? Is he caught up in post-1876 centennial fervor? Is it part of an idealization of the American past prompted by increased foreign immigration? Or is it a return to his youthful roots, an older man's attempt to leave a legacy? 
Charles spends the last two years of his life in an upstate New York sanitarium in poor health. His brother, Harry, the U.S. Senator, writes to their sister, Jenny, about Charles's condition. This dying business is a poor thing anyway, and I suppose there is really no good way of pulling it off. Charles and Margaret's middle son, Alexander, precedes them in death, dying from wounds received in World War I. And that's who Providence's Lippitt Park is named in honor of. Eldest son, Charlie, also a World War I vet, marries and brings his infant son, Charles Warren III, to the sanitarium so Charles can meet his namesake grandchild the summer of 1923. Charles dies in 1924 at the age of 77. At the time of his death, youngest son Gordon is traveling the world with his young family, dealing with PTSD and the physical effects of gas from his service in France. After Charles's death, son Charlie has the Breakwater Mansion raised and the property sold. Margaret renovates and moves into the outbuilding behind their Providence house where she lives for the next 16 years until her death in 1940. The house on Young Orchard is also raised in 1925. Despite early interests in travel, academics, and a desire to study law, Charles becomes the fourth generation of his family to work in textile manufacturing during the Second Industrial Revolution. The years after the Civil War were a period of rapid industrialization, urbanization, and immigration in Rhode Island. He leads his family's business in the time before much of that industry moves south, seeking cheaper non-union labor. His wealth provides access to the corridors of government when business interests determine economic and political policy. Later in life, he devotes his time to researching, writing, speaking, and supporting civic groups. Historical writing survives for 100 years when neither of his homes nor the mill he devotes his career to still stand, victims of Rhode Island's post-industrial decline. I wonder if he wasn't born to one of Rhode Island's five founding families, what path would Charles Warren Lippitt have chosen for himself? I think this evening we've seen some parallels and uh, differences in the professional and personal lives of Charles Lippitt and James Dooley during a type of rapid change in the United States. And so at this time, uh, Kathy and I can now um, take any questions you might have. I'm going to start just by asking the two of you to reflect a little. Um, Carrie and Kathy, as you were working on your research, having conversations and watching the presentations tonight, was there anything that surprised you? Uh, anything that you thought um, that really raised um, a new curious idea for me or um, was a piece I hadn't thought about or didn't know before? I'm not sure about that. I think I was, um, I'll start by saying that, like, I think I was initially really surprised in general about just how similar their lives were, considering where Carrie and I kind of started this conversation from thinking about North and South and post-Civil War and um, all, you know, generational wealth and not a whole lot, and but having some advantages. I mean, both of them start from an advantaged youth and therefore just how much that helped both of them right away kind of be ready after the war to take advantage of everything that um, was happening in, the, in their cities at the time. What about you, Carrie? Yeah, I would have to say a uh, uh, similar. I mean, I knew that um, both these guys were, we picked them because they were both contemporaries. And I thought there would be some similarities, but I honestly thought there would be more contrast given one was a Republican, one was a Democrat, you know, opposite sides when there was still a lot of division in the country, you know, when we're talking about, especially in the 1870s and the 1880s in the reconstruction period. And I was surprised to see the more research I went into the details of Charles Lippitt's life and then learning more about James Dooley, how uh, parallel their lives were, even though there were these 
um, disparities in their backgrounds, especially with Charles being a, a very traditional New England Yankee and Dooley being of this, um, you know, a relatively recent, you know, um, immigrant in Virginia. The similarities were quite striking the more we kind of uh, got into it. Yeah. So one of the questions, uh, just uh, have the two of you visited each other's institutions? Can you talk a little bit about your uh, crossover knowledge here? Well, um, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, since I um, lived in Virginia for 15 years before I moved up here to Providence, I have visited um, Maymont, I'll admit not very recently, but I have visited Maymont before and on the slide I showed uh, previously, um, you know, the the swan bed is one of the, you know, memories that I remember the the best, but it's a, a lovely uh, facility. And I think it's, a, I know that it's a, a site that's really, um, really um, uh, it's held dear by lots of rich, Richmonder. So that was one of the reasons why I reached out to uh, Kathy about uh, this possible uh, program. Yeah, and I have to admit that I'm sorry to say I've not been to Lippitt House. <laughs> I That's did okay. live in Rhode Island for four years and I did mean to come, um, but I did not make this it. This wasn't <laughs> meant to shame you. Okay. <laughs> but you are I, yeah. I will come next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, this kind of leads to a couple of other questions. I, Kathy, we do know you um, spent time in Newport. And so there was a question. Um, from some of it, do you think the Vanderbilt's Astors and uh, the other folks would have welcomed the Lippets uh, to Newport or uh, would they have, I mean, that was a very discerning uh, society down there about who they accepted and didn't. And yeah, yeah, it's for the Dooleys or for the Lippets? For the Dooleys, I don't know that they would. Well, the Lip, <laughs> yeah, the Lip, because the Lippets were down there. Yeah, yeah did they, how did, were they welcomed, Carrie? Yeah. I don't know specifically what I did find out, which I think I mentioned um, to Kathy on an earlier call when I was um, uh, doing some research, I saw that um, there was a little bit of a lawsuit between um, um, Alva, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what's her, Mary, Alva Vanderbilt? Vanderbilt um, Belmont. 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 I almost forgot her new Mary, her new Mary name, <laughs> Mrs. Belmont and uh, Charles Warren Lippett about um, for uh, the, the main road that goes down to his Newport house uh, was Ledge Road. And I didn't get into it because it wasn't the point of the research. I was trying to focus on other things, but it had to be do with, um, I think Charles Lippett wanted to close the end of Ledge Road and apparently Elva didn't want to. Maybe she wanted to go to the beach. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, apparently they had a, a little bit of a dispute about roads, which I think is not uncommon for uh, Newport. I think that goes on today, but I don't know how much they um, hung out socially. Charles did um, belong to the Newport uh, Reading Room, which is a kind of gentleman's mm -hmm. club, um, but I really don't know uh, all the clubs and uh, goings on. I'm sure they uh, their paths crossed. I know that Charles's mother, Mary Ann Lippett, the lady of the house I'm in right now that still survives. Um, she did entertain the Vanderbilts of Rough Point, which is an earlier generation. And um, that was Kathy's job, but not my job. I can't keep all the Vanderbilts straight. I would need a chart. <laughs> uh, yes, they are complicated legacies. Um, so, you know, one of the questions or sort of questions about whether you think they would have gotten along and and this is all a for speculation and there's a, you know, kind of one of the questions around that is you know mr lippet worked against workers rights uh for example he was opposed to that 10-hour workday did um mr dooley have similar views or policies regarding the that the workforce that you knew the labor force you know i don't know that in particular um since julie wasn't really doing um factory stuff but i would imagine to the first part of the 
question that they probably would have gotten along pretty well. I mean, it sounds like um, they both were pretty entrepreneurial, but also as you hear more about um, Lippitt's interest in history and those sorts of things, I think that they would have had a lot of common ground um, in their both their work ethic and their personal pursuits. Yeah, and I think, Carrie, this almost seems like a little bit of an opportunity to talk about um, uh, Charles's uh, sister, who was good friends with a Southerner, uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe. Yeah, the um, uh, the the one of the lip the youngest Lippet daughter, who would have been uh, Charlie's little sister. Um, Abby went to finishing school in New York City with Juliet Gordon Lowe, who was the founder of the Girl Scouts, and the, uh, their family was in Savannah. And so there was a Southern connection in that Juliet came and stayed at least, a, I think, a couple of times here in Providence and became a real family friend. Um, and kind of paled around with them and really became lifelong friends with the Lippet girls, the Lippet sisters. So there is a kind of a surprising, once again, in this post-war period, another kind of a strong family um, connection with another Southern, Southern family for the Lippets. So speaking of the women, we have a couple of questions about uh, the uh the the two matriarchs who were both opposed to women's suffrage and if you can talk a little bit about what compelled them and maybe how they act um how they reacted once they were eligible to vote um kathy do you want to go or should i go right ahead oh <laughs> uh, well um we um I don't know specifically about Margaret. I mean, she does become involved in the um, Republican Party. But what I do know is she doesn't seem to be as active politically after the 19th Amendment is passed as she was in the anti-suffrage movement. But what she does get involved with is another a conservative political cause as she gets involved in the anti-prohibition movement. And that's what she actually lists in her um, obituary. She doesn't mention anything about her very, goes on for years as her anti-suffrage work. That doesn't get mentioned at all in her obituary, but what she does get mentioned in her obit is her work on the um, work to, um, against, um, prohibition, um, which is, I think, kind of in interesting. So she still keeps a political action going, but not that, that way. Yeah, and similarly for Sally, um, we do not know that she did ever vote. I, I would not imagine that she did. She was very staunchly opposed. Um, interestingly, um, Mr. Julie's sisters and his nieces were all pro and um, were very much suffragists and rallied in front of the Capitol in Richmond. There's a very famous photo in Virginia of his sisters and nieces um, in front of the Capitol um, uh, rallying for the right to vote. So we do wonder how tense the dinner parties were between them at times. <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't know that, I don't think she did ever vote that we're aware of. Um, and it's not, that she's not politically active at all. Um, and so we don't, um, she did, it, yeah, not a thing for her. <laughs> no, now we have several uh, specific uh, questions about Maymont. So I wanna make sure we get some of those. Okay. So, and I can try uh, and answer a few in the chat if it's helpful. Yeah, or if you just want to tick through them because you can okay. see them here. Yeah. yeah, so I see somebody's asking about the swan bed. Yes, it does date to the 1890s. Um, well, no, I, sorry. It dates to the 19 teens. Um, it was for the Julie Summer Home Swananoa, this uh, suite of furniture. It's a swan bed, swan walking chair, swan desk, swan dresser, um, and two actually additional smaller swan day beds. Um, but yeah, they were all for the summer home. Um, and done by Newman and Company in New York. Um, they did have 
several servants in the house at Maymont. So they had 10 in the house and 20 for the grounds. And um, wow. uh, they were all primarily African-American as was common in the South at the time. There was a head, um, head estate manager who had a house on the grounds and he was white, um, but almost all of the rest of the staff, except for him and the chauffeurs uh, were, were white and everybody else was African-American. Um, and no plans to restore Swananoa um, that I am aware of. Um, the current owner is a descendant of the family that purchased it many, many decades ago. Um, it is open uh, sometimes in the summer and for events. Um, and uh, yeah, we maintain a good relationship with them and try and keep an eye on things and recommend resources. Um, but it is their family's home and, and they are very proud of it. Wow. Well, the I think this is a nice question to kind of wrap up our conversation with. Um, uh, oh, dear. Oh. Sorry, more questions keep coming in. All right, I know. Um, let me ask. So let, I will going to ask. Um, so there's a question here. Uh, so I'll take two more questions. So this one, when you both use the term capitalist for the late 1800s or the early 1900s, is there anything that people assume incorrectly with our 21st century minds, like common economic fights of the time period or people's common sentiments towards the economic system? I didn't use it. I used industrialist, um, mm -hmm. which is what a contemporary term is because it really kind of relates to the manufacturing that's especially for here in uh, Providence because of that wide range of production that's going on. I don't know if Kathy has. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the more contemporary word I would say is entrepreneur for Dooley. Um, he is listed in 1902 as capitalist that was sort of the more popular name of the period but I would say I would say we would think of it as more that he was an entrepreneur um I mean he, he was an investor primarily in in other things um so not not an industrialist but yeah I think entrepreneur well uh, well, so our, for our final question uh is sort of about the legacy of the the two families of you know, the philanthropy and I would say the public service of both of the families, what are those legacies today in your, in the two communities? And... For me, my, or for, for the Dooleys, it's quite extensive in Richmond. Um, not only did we have, do we have Maymont as, you know, this wonderful sort of gem for all of the Richmond to enjoy. It is a free public park in the center of Richmond. Um, and so it is enjoyed by thousands of people every year. Um, but Dooley, I think I mentioned, uh, did leave money to start the Richmond Public Library, which the main branch downtown still exists. Um, he left money for the Medical College of Virginia. Um, they left money to their churches, which are still there. So you can see their works throughout Richmond when you, when you walk around um, in the historic areas. Yeah. What about you, Carrie? Um, for the the lipids, I would I would take it a, a, a different way um, and think of really the legacy of the Lippet family is really a commitment to public service that there's generations of Lippets who have uh, served in public elected public office um, and the women with their uh, volunteer offices as as, as well with um uh, Margaret Lippitt um, was recognized for her volunteer work during World War I with um, a, um, a medal from the French, um, uh, French government for civilians going kind of above and beyond for uh, service during the war. And so it's not only the men who served in public office, but also the women's dedication. And this goes on into the all the branches of the Lippitt family in the 20th century and into the 21st century. And so I would say that that's really um, a great legacy. And we see it here in, in uh, many areas around the state and here in Providence, for example, um, Charles's mother and um, sister um, started the Rhode Island School for the Deaf, which is still in operation today. So I think there's a lot, lot of ways that that 
lipid legacy is still um, uh, uh, around us today um, all throughout the state of Rhode Island. Harry and Kathy, I want to thank you so much for the uh, hours of thoughtful research uh, that you put into your presentations. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much um, for responding to our call and playing with us in this virtual environment. Uh, this has been great fun for us. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight. Uh, we will, um, you should have all received an email with a short survey. So I do hope that you will take a few moments just to answer a few questions that helps us both our organizations and our future planning. And uh, we will be sending out an email uh, when we do have a recording available so you can watch this again or share it with your family and friends. And thank you, anything else? All right. Yeah. Safe travels, everyone. <laughs> and we hope to see you at our institutions.